So today we're going to interview uh, Conor Marcati, the CEO of uh, Emerald Airline. And we're very pleased to ask him many questions about what's going on in the uh, low-cost carrier, flagship carrier, Amaros, as he has a very broad experience. I think you, you've been co-founder of Eurasia a couple of years ago, and yeah. uh, you are, of course, in the Amaro with Dublin Aerospace, and today as a CEO of uh, Emerald uh, Airline. So uh, welcome. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks, Anya. No problem. I'm going to kick in with the first question then, uh, Connor, which is, you know, Stefan has just talked about your, your career and so on. How did you get into aviation to begin with? Um, I guess, like a lot of people in my era, um, I got into aviation when I applied for an apprenticeship with Aer Lingus at the age of 16 and was given a, an apprenticeship with uh, as an aircraft electrician and uh, never looked back. And in fact, today I'm sitting here in the very hangar that I started my apprenticeship in because it's uh, come full circle for me. I've traveled around the world. We set up airlines like Jetstar in Australia, AirAsia, Indonesia, AirAsia, Thailand, AirAsia, Malaysia, Viva Aerobus in Mexico. And then about 11 years ago, uh, Dublin Aerospace was born out of the ashes of SR Technics. Yeah, so this business moves in circles. Very good. So how does it feel to be back in the hangar again after so long? It's great. We've been here, obviously, throughout the pandemic, we've been open. We uh, immediately uh, adopted strict social distancing and mask wearing etiquette and uh, also divided our team up into different units and they worked opposing shifts with a, a fire break in between, uh, with the result that uh, after 13 months, despite, you know, a lot of COVID cases here in Ireland, um no no transmissions took place on on the site of the of dublin airspace whatsoever so we're very proud of that and uh, also proud to have come through what has got to be the most difficult period in uh, the industry um and we've managed to do it by and keep all our people employed um keep them all on full pay and also uh, even made a small uh, positive margin last year not one to boast about, but at least it was positive. So, uh, and the most important thing was we've kept our people together. So yeah. the, the stability of employment, the continuity of the team, the, the whole um, zeitgeist in the business is, is protected. So for us, that's more important because the long term uh, will be okay once you do that. Perfect. Yeah. Now you you are a CEO of Emerald Airlines, a brand new airline you have just created. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, like I, I didn't have enough to do uh, because in Dublin Aerospace, we we also started a new MRO last year uh, in Exeter, where we took over the former Flybe maintenance hangars. So we started Exeter Aerospace. We've also built a, a brand new state-of-the-art uh, landing gear facility. Um, not far from the airport here, which is opening this month. Uh, and we've invested about $15 million in that facility. Um, but uh, during the, the middle of last year, um, Aer Lingus uh, advertised their regional franchise for uh, renewal. So they advertised the Aer Lingus regional network, which is, involves flights between uh, within Ireland, but also a, a large uh, network between Ireland and the UK, um, which predominantly offers um, business connections for um, Dublin, Cork and Belfast, but also is a significant feeder to the Aer Lingus transatlantic network. And uh, as you, you may know, Dublin is now, I think, the sixth largest transatlantic gateway in Europe. So uh, as a as a city it ranks i think 17th in europe in terms of size but in terms of transatlantic uh, gateways um it is the sixth largest uh, in terms of passengers carried so uh, a lot of those feeder flights from the uk provincial uh, cities come to dublin uh, those customers clear customs and immigration for the us here in dublin and fly onwards to north america you know us and canada so um, that um, franchise came up for renewal. It's a 10 year franchise. Um, at one point in my career, I was running Aer Lingus Commuter um, and it, it largely is the same sort of network as Aer Lingus Commuter operated. So I felt it's a good time to maybe 
try my hand at the commuter business again. And uh, so we were successful. We were awarded the preferred bidder in uh, November 2020. And uh, we also then in the last few months have concluded a, a signed MOU with Aer Lingus. Uh, we've signed up for our first six aircraft out of a total fleet of 15. And uh, we've recruited our, our C-suite and we've recruited a number of our initial key players in engineering, tech services, flight ops, and even cabin crew instructors. So yeah, we're well on the way to getting uh, operational later this summer. And Connor, I, I read in the press that you set up Emerald Airlines with a view to uh, pitching for that business. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, if, if you hadn't gotten it, was there a plan B? No, no, I close it down. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No, I, I mean the idea was we were we set it up for a specific purpose. Um, We've a very strong uh, relationship with Aer Lingus um, here in Dublin airspace. We we overhauled the Aer Lingus short haul fleet of A three twenties and three twenty ones, and we've been doing that for a long time. Um, and we we know the management team in Aer Lingus very well. We like working with them, and we felt this was this was a, a franchise that was made for us and. Um, yeah, we were very fortunate and it's it sounds strange because we we hadn't a, an operational aoc um but interestingly because of covid any existing operators um were severely damaged and their balance sheets were were damaged to the extent that um they would be huge liabilities uh, whereas we were able to start up this year with a clean balance sheet with fresh capital with no historic debts or liabilities and if you ask me, it's probably, it's never been a better time to start an airline because first of all, people, people are the most important uh, ingredient in any business. There's a, a huge amount of available talent and it's it's not just available, it's available at attractive prices. Um, and by that, I mean, we've got a, a huge number of really experienced people who for no fault of their own are not working in the airline business. Um, we all share a love of aviation. Once you work in aviation, it's a difficult drug to come off. So uh, I guess uh, we've got those people who want to stay in the business. And um, frankly, it's a matter of, of choosing the person who is the best fit. Um, because unfortunately, there's so many people looking for work. Um, we're able to identify somebody who, who would work well in the business for the various functions. Um, so for example, um, we're hiring uh, type rated ATR 72 pilots um, but you know I've had a number of captains on A380s with 25,000 hours experience apply and you know to be quite honest I've had to say listen we really appreciate your interest and your uh, you know we're flattered by your your application but it just won't work for you because first of all you'll be flying four flights a day five days a week and um, You'll be flying in all sorts of weather um, and you will earn I probably, you know, less than one third of, of what you did as an A380 skipper. And um, so, you know, whatever about your love of flying, you won't be happy in this business after two weeks. So let's be honest. Um, so we're, we're out there trying to find the best people. It's a fantastic time to get aircraft. There's over 100 ATR 72s parked at the moment. And that's our chosen aircraft type. It's a very efficient type. It's well proven. There's no outstanding technical issues to be ironed out. Um, the engines work very well. There's no great new technology coming around the corner uh, unless you want to include hydrogen power in that. That's not that's not an, around the next corner. Um, and so we we know we're 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 dealing with a very strong platform technically and from a, an operational cost point of view. Um, so we can pick up those aircraft at you know less than half of what they were fetching in lease rates only two years ago. So again, there's a there's it's a great time to start up, and we've we've met with and selected the very best of aircraft or airline operating systems and maintenance systems, and we have contracted with the basically the blue chip providers of the latest technology to airlines, um, and again. You know, in good times, we might not get uh, too much of interest from some of those businesses because they're so busy with their 
larger clients. But in 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 our case, um, we're basically one of the few buyers in town. So we got wonderful attention, a very good interaction with these businesses. And, and as a result of which, we've been able to select the very best of uh, IT systems. So uh, yeah, it's an exciting time. We're about to give birth to a new airline baby and we're all happy about it. Right, congrats about it. And uh, yeah. do you see, as you said, it's commuter, so it's completely different because you are feeding the Dublin airport. So it's uh, between the flagship carrier, you have to be on time pretty much, and the LCC. But how do you position the LCC, the, the commuter between the LCC and the flagship carrier? In terms yeah, of that's a, and so on? It's a good question. And so if I was to give you a picture, uh, our, our single biggest competitor out of Dublin on the route network we operate uh, will be Ryanair with 189-seater 737-800s. Our biggest competitor out of Belfast is probably EasyJet with 180-seater A320s. And, um, excuse me. <coughs> um, so we, we have, uh, we've got some really strong low-cost competitors there with very low fares. Um, but where we are uh, is we're feeding uh, a legacy airline, Aer Lingus, which has produced some really really good results over the last 10 years an extremely strong return on on capital invested very good margins pretty good growth and uh, a particularly excellent performance on the transatlantic network so we're feeding them with some very high value customers on their uh, through our uk dublin routes um so there's a couple of things uh, for those of you not operating in europe you may not be aware but the EU has a regulation called EU 261 and that regulation uh, basically uh, insists that airlines compensate their customers for delays that are in the airlines control or considered to be in the airlines control and that compensation is extremely high so uh, for the kind of fares we charge uh, or indeed the low cost carriers charge um, the penalty for a delayed flight is usually a multiple of the fare paid it's it bears no relation to the the fare that you buy on uh you know uh, emerald or on ryanair or on easyjet so uh, we must be on time we must be reliable so we would build in reliability and resilience into our operation uh, and the second most important thing or uh, an equally important thing i could say is um Aer Lingus will uh, have a, a number of transatlantic departures which have become critical. And if our flights are not reliable in terms of delivering the passenger in time to make the connection, um, then that passenger will, will not only uh, be delayed that day, but they may never come this way again. So it's absolutely okay. essential that our customers can rely on our product, can rely on the connection working and rely on the convenience of a short transatlantic connection at Dublin, where the time on the ground is productively spent uh, clearing US customs and immigration. So not only are you on the ground for an hour, in that time you've managed to clear US customs and immigration. So when you arrive in New York, Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago, you walk straight through like a domestic US passenger. Uh, and that's a, that's a great advantage, but we have to be reliable in order to, to deliver that service. Uh, yeah, and, and and Connor, just listening to you, you know, I can hear the, the passion for aviation coming through and you describing, you know, setting up an airline in the middle of a COVID crisis and, and so on. Um, you're obviously not afraid to take risk. Uh, what, do you, what, do you think, uh, what do you think are the key traits or, you know, what makes you so successful, Connor McCarthy? Hmm. The key traits to stay in aviation for 42 years, uh, insanity has to be number one. <laughs> uh, a, a, a dedication, willing to, to die for your, your art. Uh, no, but I, I guess um, it, it's like, I suppose it's like anybody who, who has a passion for what they do. You don't consider the failures, you consider the ways to achieve success. And if something gets in your way, you, you, don't, you don't fixate on it you look at alternatives. So when, um, I, as I think it's the same for any uh, walk of life. An, an entrepreneur looks for gaps in the fence, you know, um, an administrator may look uh, 
for defense, but we don't look for defense. We look for gaps in defense. Um, in aviation, that's somewhat challenging because that's on one hand as we look at the business, but then as we look at our operations and we look at engineering and safety and training, we have to look not just to uh, very, very kind of uh, effective methods of training and uh, maintenance, etc. We have to ensure that our compliance is to the very highest levels. So it it, it sometimes does mean that uh, without adequate levels of experience, um, you know, an entrepreneur mindset alone in aviation. Um, can be a problem because you really do need to understand deeply why safety is paramount and why, you know, having very strong standards, not just of safety, but also of reporting and of training and of, you know, recruitment uh, are equally important. But it does all, as I said earlier, come down to the people, not just myself, the people on the team. We've really like uh this week we filled our, our last position in our c-suite um so we have a really fantastic team um not all from aviation uh but there's over 250 years of aviation experience in our c-suite in emerald and most of that is relevant local experience too so it's fantastic to have that on board we're we're very fortunate really in that regard fantastic yeah what kind of advice would you give to somebody who has, uh, who has lost his job on during the COVID, uh, either a technician, pilot? What do you think is going to be the skill you need to get for the next five, ten years? Um, okay, uh, first thing I say is for those of you watching this who have lost your role or your, your job, um, you haven't lost your skill. You, you still have your skill and you can you can maintain that skill. Um, and you can retrieve that skill very quickly to currency. Um, and we are now at the uh, beginning of the end. In fact, we're past the beginning of the end. We, we reached the beginning of the end of COVID when the you know five vaccines were endorsed and approved. Um, here in Ireland, we have over half of the adult population has been vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. Um, you know, we've half of our workforce has been vaccinated um, and before the end of June, we will see um, probably 75 to 80 percent of the Irish population will have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And we're not so different to the rest of Europe. And that's not so different to uh, the US and the UK. So I think when you look at that, um, you can see that there is a huge desire to get back to some degree of normality. And people are also have moved from this time last year where we were in fear of COVID um, to much, much less fear. So not only are the vaccines very effective, the treatments of the disease are also very effective. And we're, we're seeing that uh, treatments uh, roll out across the world. We're seeing the vaccines begin to come out throughout the world as well. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, the important thing now is not to lose hope at this late stage because um, salvation is only around the corner. And I think what's going to happen is we will see um, somewhat of a stuttering restart of aviation in the Northern Hemisphere in the next three months. So it, to varying degrees of success, we will see people and airlines return to the skies. Um, and then as that begins to really take a foothold, and the COVAX program for the rest of the world, particularly for the third world, will begin to roll out also. I think we'll start to see the global recovery uh, of aviation. Um, and certainly by next spring, I think we can, we can be pretty assured that we're going to see a, a huge resurgence of, of air travel. So, mm, Which is good timing, Connor, for your, the, the start of your contract with Aer Lingus. Yeah, I'm lucky. Uh, actually, the contract doesn't formally start until late 23. 22. Yeah, into 23. We'll do a transition in late 22. Um, but it is good timing for sure. Um, but I, I think summer of 22, we'll see aviation make a pretty strong recovery. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a worry about the variants uh, that are emerging. Um, but, you know, the science seems to be keeping very strongly on top of that. And 
you know, our, our scientists and, and uh, medical research companies have delivered fantastically well. And I, I just, I, I'm just hugely uh, optimistic about the outcomes. And um, so if, if I was to say to people who are looking at this, who have a, an engineering uh, qualification or a, a flying qualification, I think uh, you're going to see airlines back in search for your skills in the not too distant future. Um, attitude as ever is going to be their number one requirement. And you may be qualified on, you know, the A380 and have to retrain on the Boeing 787 or the you know, uh, the A350 or whatever. But that is that is not going to be as big an issue as people might worry about. Um, the challenge is going to be for those people who are maybe caught in what they see as a, an age uh, profile that doesn't work for some of the airlines. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to figure out, do I spend $30,000 on type training for somebody with three years left on their license or whatever? Um, but again, I think we'll, we'll, we've seen already in some countries a, a, an approach to that that's, you know, one that is needs driven. Um, yeah. And I can see people being asked to maybe contribute to that. Um, but I, I think most people will, will be willing to do a trade off in order to get back in the cockpit or indeed back uh, working on the aircraft. Yeah, you, yeah, you said attitudes there and yeah, the ability to adapt and so on. Um, and I'd like to come back to Stefan's question about skills. And you said that you've just finished recruiting your C-suite. So I'm curious to know, apart from all the aviation skills and the technical skills and, and so on, what are the soft skills that you think are important now for your C-suite and for leading this organization, but generally speaking in aviation? Yeah, soft skills, interesting one. Well, uh, one of our positions is head of people and culture. So we we, we haven't uh, looked for somebody who would just know HR, if you like, and all of all of the, you know, challenging uh, qualifications and uh, practices that come with a, a well-run HR department. We want someone who's going to help us, you know, invent our culture and um, reinforce that culture at every opportunity. So when people join us, they they join us for not just a, a job and a pay packet, but they join to belong to something. And that by, by belonging to something that reflects their own values, that they feel that they they are they belong here more than other places. Um, we're very conscious, we're a commuter airline, we fly 72 seater aircraft, you know, the, uh, the, the salary points, the price points we have are going to be dictated by our, you know, uh, competitors who are flying very efficient aircraft at high volumes. So we have to be, you know, relevant in terms of cost. Um, so we, we want to ensure we do that while having people who are very happy to work here because it, it, it becomes a real retention issue. And um, so that's important. Diversity is important to us. Um, again, not because it's uh, good to have or a nice to have. We just feel diversity of all types of diversity helps you have a better business. It, it helps you make better decisions. It helps you understand your customers better. And, you know, uh, even if we take uh, things like gender diversity, if you can get a good gender diversity around the table when you're making decisions, in, in practice, I've found over the years, it just leads to better decisions. And as a result of that, um, I'm a fan of it. Now, what I don't like is a, a quota. Um, and while I understand the need for quotas, I don't like them because you, you start to dictate, oh, we have to hire a, a man for this role who's already four women on the uh, on the management team, um, or more more likely is gonna, we're gonna have to hire a woman on this role. Um, and, you know, for me, I think that's, uh, almost disingenuous and it's it's also uh it's undermining the the benefits of real gender diversity because you're you're going out of your way to do something right but you know sometimes you, you're you're taking uh you know you, you're taking prisoners on the way really by doing that so for us we we like to get that mix and like to encourage it and um, so that's the soft skill i suppose mm -hmm. um, other soft skills it, it's just simply um we've got on average, 55 minutes to make sure our customers like us and to make sure that they uh, appreciate what we do and come back to us the next time. Um, it's 
you know, it's a it's a forgotten skill in aviation is the ability to be friendly and nice and yeah. for people to feel they're genuinely welcome on board an aircraft. Um, and for us, that's really important because we can't do a lot on a 55 minute flight other than serve people, you know, a cup of coffee and a nice snack or a, a drink in the evening coming back from a day's business in Edinburgh. But what we want to be able to do is make sure that it's pleasant, it's reliable and that they have no reason to go somewhere else to fly the next time. Mm -hmm. So they, there's a lot of soft skills come in on that front, particularly yeah. with Aer Lingus as the brand. I mean, the Aer Lingus brand is, is famous for its friendliness. So we have to figure out ways to be even more friendly than Aer Lingus. Great. Thanks for that, Connor. Cheers.